People from the Netherlands, good morning. People from China, good afternoon. Thank you for waiting and welcome to this third episode of our hydrogen webinar series. Just like last week, we'll start with a video session of one hour and afterwards there will be a half an hour to 45 minutes panel discussion with all our panelists. Thank you. 荷兰的观众们，早上好。中国的观众们，下午好。欢迎来到我们一两五场综合精神线上研讨会的第三场。我是丁晓峰，今天回忆的主持人来自荷兰科技转型网络广州办公室。这次线上研讨会由荷兰
I'm very grateful to be here today with you. And I'm very thankful to the CG Guangzhou, the Netherlands Innovation Network and UNDP to make this series of webinar happen. And I'm also very grateful for the big and great companies that are today with us and the scholars that are attending this meeting as well. Unfortunately, due to some technical issues, the speaker from my ministry, Ms. Els de Witt, was not able to do the opening today. So you have to do it with me. But at the end of this meeting, Els de Witt will attend in the discussion and we will also share the very informative presentation she sent to us. Having this said, the Netherlands, like other countries, faces a big challenge towards the reduction of CO2. Our goal is set to reduce CO2 with 49 to 55% by 2030. My ministry is responsible for the reduction of CO2 in the track of mobility. Hydrogen is one of the important factors that can make this happen. The cabinet recently drafted a hydrogen vision to push efforts forward. The essence of our policy is to stimulate the development of refueling stations and to develop real green hydrogen. And together with local authorities, we focus on the use of heavy duty vehicles working on hydrogen. That hopefully in 2025 will result in about 3000 heavy duty vehicles on the road and 50 refueling stations in Netherlands. The first stations already have been built and the first vehicles are on the road. As said before, we are facing a big challenge and we cannot do this alone. We need strong and innovative companies to assist us with the goals we have set. And we also need to work closely together with frontrunner countries in Europe and outside Europe, like China. Because of the major role companies play in the energy transition, the Dutch government in 2019 signed an agreement with five companies in the field of hydrogen to create a bridge between their technologies and the large market in China. Those companies will pay visits to China, do research and hopefully stimulate the exchange of knowledge and business between our two countries. For the next 45 minutes, the Dutch companies involved in the PIB will tell you about their projects. At the end, we will have an interactive discussion and I would like to encourage you to actively be part of that discussion. If you have any more questions, you're free at any time to ask them to us. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a very interesting webinar. And I hope to see you again soon. Hada 第一张就是介绍我们那个荷兰清电那个背景图就是我们的核心技术就是那个电堆质子交换模软料电池电堆第二张就是介绍我们公司荷兰清电成立的比较早九九年成立的荷兰清电最关键的一个核心的一个我
，呃，燃料电池用在热电联产，呃，这个应用领域的一个介绍，呃，可以看到有一个这个图中呢，有一个绿色的一个氢气瓶，啊、呃，或者一个直径模块。然后燃料电池呢，它的冷却回路呢，就是用来去做那个导热，这样它的呃低频位的热量就是呃六十到八十度啊之间，这个热量可以回收利用。那什么样的那个行业呃会需要这个固定式发电站呢？呃，主要是在国内呢，主要是两种，一个是丙烷脱氢。呃，脱完氢之后有大量的副产氢气，对吧？还有一个是氯碱化工，氯碱呢，呃，也是有那个副产氢气。我们觉得这两个目标市场比较合适。后燃氢电是那个根据那个超长寿命这个特性去开发了一系列的那个燃料电池的产品。那个不仅仅是那个呃船用。那个燃料电池和车用燃料电池，还有我们这个固定式发电站燃料电池，呃，实例参考。这边能看到那个格罗宁根市安装的一套七十五千瓦的固定式燃料电池发电系统。这个发电系统就是安装在安装在一个呃化工呃一个化工园区的现场。那个这样呢，那个呃，副产氢气呢就在旁边支取的，然后呢，呃，那个引到我们这个发电站呢，就这个是这个呃距离很短，然后呢，呃，不需要呃加压，也不需要那个呃提纯，可以直接拿过来去用，用来发电。当然呢，我们这边是呃热电联产的系统，也就是那个电力、热量呃都可以发出来。那么可能在想这个热电联产这个效率怎么样？一般的那个呃方便就方便你算啊，这个效率是百分之五十左右，也就是说这个燃料的这个按照它的那个呃地热值的这个算法啊，这个燃料发出来的百分之五十是那个电力，百分之五十是热量啊。那可能它呃有的不同燃料电池系统嘛，可能是这个效率不是不是百分之五十，可能那个呃电力效率可能是百分之四十到百分之五十之间，要看各种呃各种那个不同的燃料电池厂家，嗯，再往下看吧，呃第九章是那个另外在河比卢三国地区的一个呃氢能电站。那么大家那个仔细看一下这个呃照片，右手边有呃那个四扇透明的门窗，门窗后面呢那个一个一个堆叠的就是我们燃料电池的电堆，所以呢它是模块化，呃这个照片呢就是呃能看出来，因为这是一兆瓦。的一个呃那个输出功率的一个综呃系统的综合功率是一兆瓦，啊，那这个能看出来一个，我觉得是通过这张图呢能看出来一个我们这个燃料电池行业比较常见的一个误会，也就是说你的电堆的功率呃和你的系统的功率是两码事那个系统功率呢呃可能比较大，电堆功率可能比较小。还有的系统功率比较小，电堆功率比较大。就比如说一个单堆系统，比如说我有一台啊，那个十五千瓦的电堆，那我就用做一个用来做一个十千瓦的一个系统，因为可能会有一个五千瓦的内耗，对吧？嗯，所以呢，那看这个照片呢，我们那个荷兰氢电最大的那个电堆也才那个十三到十五千瓦之间。但是呢，我们仍然能做到那个比较靠谱的、使用寿命很长的那个氢能电站的兆瓦级的氢能电站。那这是为什么呢？这也看你怎么那个串联、怎么并联，对吧？你的气体管理、呃，氢气管理、那个呃，氢路管理、空路管理、呃，水路管理，还有你的电气管理，对吧？这四个方面。所以这个就是呃一个比较常见的误会：你的电堆的呃功率跟你的。系统输出功率是不一样的。第十章是，呃，我们那个荷兰氢电，呃，那个在中国辽宁省，呃，营口市安装的一套两兆瓦
的那个氢能建站，是在银创三庄，呃，这家那个化工企业的现场安装的，跟上面看到的在荷兰、比利时的那个安装现场，呃，差不多的，都是把那个用氢啊、呃、的这个燃料电池安装在产氢的那个化工园区内，这样你就可以。呃，避免这个氢气的那个呃那个储运的这个问题啊，储存和运输的问题，对吧？呃，这个热电联产那个总效率百分之七十五，啊，百分之七十五，那个全年发电三百三十天，平均电价零点五元，看这个电价他们怎么算的啊？这个项目呢是呃欧盟那个资助的，资助的那个。三百四十万欧元左右，呃，工厂自己投入了那个一千五百万左右，然后呢，呃，计划在五年内就可以收回这个成本，也就是投资回报期是五年，对吧？啊、呃，这个五年是否有代表性，不好说。那个，呃，一方面是欧盟有资助这个系统。如果是那个让银创三征，呃百分之百去垫资去投资的话，那可能会那个呃会比较贵，可能投资回报期比较长。但是另一方面来说，现在呢那个燃料电，因为燃料电池那个呃这个技术呢是那个一直在一直在发展中，呃然后呢功能密度也是在那个日益增加啊、呃，然后呢。那个很多很多技术啊，就是核心技术都是那个不断的在改善嘛，所以呢，呃，二零年的产品和一六年的产品其实还是存在一定的差别，所以呢，可能这个投资回报期就会短一点，对吧？到底要看那个具体，还是看那个每一个项目啊？通过上面介绍的三个案例，呃，就可以看到我们荷兰清电。在那个呃固定式发电站，也就是氢能建站的那个业绩，还有我们的一些那个安装现场和一些那个呃那个做的一些规范工作，嗯、呃，还有那个呃可以看出来一个那个兆瓦级的呃氢能建站的热电联产系统，也叫做热电联工系统，到底是怎么回事这边是我的联系方式，呃，欢迎在位的各位观观众朋友们。呃，也欢迎跟我们荷兰清电呃直接联系啊，呃，有什么关于那个呃下面有什么关于那个氢能电站的具体的问题啊，呃，那个我们在那个问答阶段，大家可以那个继续讨论。好，非常感谢啊，感谢讲海课，晋级的我们的所有的演讲嘉宾都是实时在线的，已经可以在问答区回答问题。再次谢谢讲海课。让我们请出下一位演讲嘉宾 t a y l o r Hendrix， 他会介绍 High Move 公司氢燃料电池系统及项目应用。Ladies and gentlemen,、uh, my name is t a y l o r Hendrix. I am the CEO of High Move, a company developing and producing fuel cell systems, fuel cell engines. For heavy-duty mobility, High Move was founded in 2013 by Jan van Beckhoven and myself. Both Jan and I have our background in high-tech industry and several years of experience in the European energy industry. Based on our combined experience, we decided more than 10 years ago. That hydrogen mobility, especially for heavy-duty vehicles, would be the technology of the future. After the incorporation of、um, High Move in 2013, we first invested in the development of an industrial-quality fuel cell system, which means high reliability, easy maintenance. And easy to integrate in any application. The first product where we used this、uh, fuel cell system was our own demo bus,、uh, which was designed not only to demonstrate our technology, but also to be our live laboratory to test our products 
and any improvements in, the, in due course in real life. In 2018, we developed a special system for the Chinese market according to the Chinese industrial standards and this product was certified by the Shanghai Vehicle Inspection Center in 2018. Our fuel cell engines are built in a modular way, which means that uh, each module can be tested and built separately uh, so that the end product of assembly of the modules into a complete system immediately meets all the requirements specified for the customers in for this product. The modular approach also means that maintenance is easy and that interfacing between the fuel cell engine and the vehicle is as simple as possible. Especially this integration is a, uh, an important factor in building a fuel cell vehicle which immediately functions right with not too many children's diseases. Another important feature of our fuel cell engines is the energy control strategy which is incorporated in our fuel cell controller. The control strategy is such that the fuel cell stacks always operate as close as possible to the sweet spot in their efficiency with the result that the energy consumption, the hydrogen consumption of the fuel cell engines is roughly 25% less than with comparable systems. And of course this means that the total cost of ownership of an application is considerably reduced due to the high efficiency and the long life of the fuel cell engine. Another important feature of the, our fuel cell engines is the integration technology, the integration philosophy, which makes it easy to integrate, to build a complete vehicle, and uh, we can uh, even remotely support any application, any integration in vehicles, either in Europe or in China. So far, uh, our fuel cell systems have been used in several automotive applications such as fuel cell buses, fuel cell garbage trucks and fuel cell vans. All of the applications uh, are exceptional in life and reliability as well as in energy efficiency. Our most important uh, flagship product is our own demo bus uh, which operates now since two years on a daily basis in public transportation in the Netherlands. The bus is a regular 12 meter public transportation bus but sets itself apart especially by the hydrogen consumption. The hydrogen consumption in real life is roughly 6.1 kilogram per each hundred kilometer compared to more than 9 or 10 kilogram per hundred kilometers for other buses. So a fuel consumption of more than 30 percent. Another important result of the demonstration of uh, this, uh, the, our demo bus in public transportation is the high reliability which is at least at the level of a normal diesel bus uh, at roughly 96% of availability. As a fuel cell bus, the bus is also extremely silent due to a special traction system without transmission, which makes the bus very silent. In the following video, there is a short introduction, short demonstration of the bus in a German city, which was the main reason that these German cities chose for buses with this technology to be implemented in their public transportation.
the context of HiNet, HiMove is very keen to cooperate with Chinese companies in the field of automotive or shipping mobility. We believe that our technology can really contribute to the rollout of the hydrogen mobility in China and we will be happy to cooperate with any of you in this arena. In that case, please contact us and we will respond not only in English but even in Chinese language. Thank you very much for your time. 感谢 Dale Hendrix 有趣的分享。我们赶快清楚下一位的演讲者 ，Kiva 公司可替代燃料与消费品商务经理 Dante Half， 他会介绍 Kiva 公司针对氢能应用领域的测试、检查和认证业务。Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dante Half, and I'm working for the company called Kiva. Um, we are based in the Netherlands, in Apeldoorn, in the center of the Netherlands, and we are a testing, inspection, and certification company. Um, I'm uh, representing also as a member of the PIB HiNet, um, also for this webinar, and I will try to give you a short introduction about uh, Kiva um, and what we're about to do and what we're doing at the moment, and what our future plans look like for um, the automotive industry. Uh, well, as you can see here, uh, we are an um, international-based uh, company, um, centralized, centralized in uh, the Netherlands, where our headquarters are. Um, up till now, about 4,650 people working at Kiva. Um, we present uh, uh, offices in uh, around 40 countries uh, throughout the world. We are also represented in um, China. Kiva China is based in Guangzhou. Um, we are trying to um, um, maintain our position in uh, the testing, inspection and certification world. At the moment, we are currently number 15 in the world and we try to um, well, gain some leverage and uh, get a step ahead and try to grow. Um, as you can see here uh, on um, market share, we have a lot of different uh, markets we were able to serve. In this case, the next slide will probably give you a better ID. In this uh, slide, you can see what kind of markets are um, for Kiva there in the world, um, meaning that we have a very diverse market share, um, giving it a lot of variety within our uh, portfolio. Mm, the testing, inspection and certification world um, has a very, very wide range of um, possibilities. So as you can see here, we are um, having a lot of customers in different directions. Uh, maritime and offshore would be one of them. We can easily combine uh, the, our services for energy sectors or food, feed and farms. Um, I'm now working for, let's say, one and a half year at Kiva and I'm learning still every day what we are able to do and uh, which companies were able to help with their certification progress. Um, with these uh, markets, we are also can see that there's a diversity in the services of Kiva. Um, here we try to visualize uh, what the services are for Kiva and their customers. Um, this example is a typical example for hydrogen system integration, uh, meaning hydrogen is one of the uh, new energy carriers where we think uh, there will be a lot of um, development in the next coming decades. Um, you see in the outer circle we have several parts of Kiva, meaning we are able to do feasibility studies, we are able to uh, do consultancy work on um, hydrogen related uh, projects. Um, but as soon as that project has maybe ended and people would like to go to market and try to see whether they are a component or car is, is able to, to be sold, for example, throughout the world in, or in, 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 the, in Europe. Uh, 
Kiva is also able to do the certification of this um, component or vehicle or tank. Um, we are accredited lab in um, Apeldoorn, uh, meaning that we have ISO 17025 um, accreditation. So um, even in our global market, we are able to share that test results um, with different entities. Here you see an overview, as we call it, the hydrogen landscape. Um, one of these parts, each pillar you see, um, does mean a part of the whole supply chain of hydrogen. Um, in Europe and in China and in Japan and, and well, a lot of other countries in the world, they are developing at the moment uh, an infrastructure or planning to have an infrastructure where either a hydrogen uh, is um, added to the natural gas uh, grid. Here um, at Kiwa, we are able to share um, our knowledge uh, within every pillar. So if you see at the latest uh, standpoint, we uh, have done a lot of development at Kiwa to improve our capabilities in the lab. Um, for example, my lab uh, does have an expansion plan for next year uh, and we roughly invest ourselves uh, approximately 3 million euros to uh, gain more leverage on the testing on tanks and components when it comes to hydrogen. So that right hand pillar marketplace, that would be uh, the, the, the part, the pillar which I am representing. So our lab does have a lot of uh, expansion and planning ahead in the future time. Um, and I would like to um, show you what kind of activities we have, what kind of lab we are. Um, we call ourselves alternative fuels and pressure products, meaning um, it's a very wide range of possibilities uh, which is able to, to be tested in our lab. Formerly we were the automotive department, but we see that there's a lot of change to uh, other ways of mobility. Um, for example, aeroplanes, boats, trains, for example, are all coming um, and knock on our door to see if there's any uh, possibility to join Kiva with um, well consultancy or a certification or testing on several components. Um, formerly we were of course the automotive department and uh, we still are of course accredited. So our data is uh, ISO 17025, meaning that it can be used for several um, national entities. We ourselves are accredited as a technical service by the, uh, the Dutch Vehicle Authority, RDW, but we're also um, a technical service for the German automotive, in of automotive industry, um, the KBA. And the KBA is uh, issuing then certification with an E number E1, and the RDW will issue certification numbers with E4. Um, well, this um, contribution uh, with Kiwa and combination with these authority brings us uh, to the next slide. So here you see uh, two examples of uh, certifications. Uh, one on the left is from the RDW and one on the right. We have done that uh, with KBA. Um, before reaching as it ends a certificate, there's a lot of testing involved and a lot of uh, project management involved. So we are able to deliver the full package. Um, what are we able to deliver? That's a very good question uh, you're probably thinking of. Um, there's a lot of standards in, um, let's say, the infrastructure of a mobility and a high pressure and high pressure related pressure products. Um, on the left, you see a certain amount of standards we are having in our scope, meaning that we are able to do the certification for this standard. Um, it is a combination of the testing and then the certification, uh, some together with the uh, German or the Dutch authority, but we can also work together with KHK from Japan and um, DOT of the US. With this, of course, pressure related products are also mentioned in the ADR, the PED and the TPED. Together with uh, Kiba Inspecta, this is an, a notifying body, 
um, based in Sweden and uh, Estonia in Europe, we are able to provide um, PED and TPED approvals. And if you are very curious of what, what yeah, data we can handle, um, here's a list of some of the tests we can do. Uh, well, a lot of tests are uh, custom built, so meaning that we have to uh, combine our knowledge together with the inquiry of the customer and see if we are able to perform a test on the way they would like to have it performed. Um, these tests are um, not all done in uh, Kiva Apeldoorn. We have a restriction when it comes to safety, meaning that we cannot do, uh, let's say, a bonfire on gas cylinders and we cannot do a ballistic tests. And uh, finally, uh, this would be the last slide. Um, I would like to say that we think that Kiwa is really a one-stop shop for their customers, meaning that we can contribute from the beginning of the development of the product all the way to the end to the certification and your entry to the market. I do hope this was always clear and I'm really looking forward to your uh, possible contacts. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and stay well. 感谢他的哈佛深入系统的介绍现在在我们进出下一位演讲嘉宾之前我想提醒大家在文大区提出您的问题我们翻译可以有机会把您的问题提前翻译好再次感谢大我们下一位演讲者是韩安应用科技大学
Just a quick glance of our partners. You may recognize some of them. I won't go into further details. I would also like to mention our master program, Engineering Systems, and more specifically the Master Track Sustainable Energy. Our master program is unique and it is an applied technical master program with a focus on applied research, systems modeling, and engineering design. Rather than a traditional academic approach, we aim at the pre preparation of our students for industry. There are four master tracks to choose from, automotive, control systems, embedded systems, and sustainable energy. The program is formally acknowledged by the Dutch government. It has a duration of one and a half years, and most importantly, it is English spoken and therefore open to international students, which of course include Chinese students. The Master Track Sustainable Energy of our Master Program deals with the engineering solutions within the energy transition. There is a need for clean, uh, new clean tech energy innovations. We need to design, construct and validate smart technical energy solutions, but we also have to look at the social economical consequences. In short, we aim for technology which is reliable, sustainable, achievable and affordable. The program consists of three compulsory modules, systems modeling, applied control, and sustainable energy systems. And there are two choice models, smart power supply and data analysis. Hydrogen technology is included within the program. To summarize, I provide you with an overview of our hydrogen expertise and activities. We welcome any collaborations with Chinese partners in our projects and within our hydrogen lab. And we are looking forward to receiving Chinese students in our master program. Below are some links for more information. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Masha Smith, the Jiao. Let us begin the window environment before listening to the last one of the speakers. He is from Hyatt Company's Chief Mark Betting. 他介绍的主题是中能工设计、电化学、氢压缩及提纯系统。Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marco Betting. I'm the commercial director of Hyatt Hydrogen. It's my pleasure to present to you the next generation hydrogen processing technologies that will help in the transition from fossil to renewable energy. Hyatt Hydrogen is a Netherlands-based supplier. Of cost-effective hydrogen processing technologies, and amongst the first companies in the world that introduced electrochemical compression and separation systems at a commercial, commercially viable scale. Hyatt's unique electrochemical technology, as shown on this slide, is developed to fill high-pressure storage tanks with high-purity hydrogen at the lowest cost of total ownership. Just like PEM electrolyzers, Hyatt's hydrogen compressor. Is a solid-state device with no moving parts, and thereby overcoming the well-known disadvantages of conventional mechanical compressors, which suffer from excessive wear and tear when operated in a hydrogen environment. Hyatt Hydrogen is part of the Hyatt Group that provides critical technologies for distributed energy infrastructures, thereby allowing more renewable energy sources to connect to the grid. Besides cost-effective hydrogen compression and storage, higher technologies include ultra-low-weight photovoltaic solar foils to generate cheap power from surfaces that are not accessible for heavy solar panels, as well as smart steam methane reformers that generate blue hydrogen while efficiently capturing the CO2. To accelerate the introduction of these breakthrough technologies, we work with reputable partners and institutes Amongst them, Shell New Energies, the National Renewable Energy Labs, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in the United States. Electrochemical compressors and purifiers will add great value throughout the hydrogen supply chain, thereby reducing hydrogen production costs with more than 30% compared to the traditional mechanical compressors and separators. In hydrogen production facilities, Hyatt's Electrochemical separators are capable to selectively extract hydrogen from gas streams, much more cost-effectively than traditional adsorption systems. On the other end, our electrochemical compressors enable low-cost, high-pressure hydrogen storage for hydrogen refueling stations, but also for power-to-power -power facilities and seasonal storage for 
building heating and power applications. The heart of the electrochemical compressor is the electrochemical cell, consisting of a proton exchange membrane with electrodes mounted on both sides of the membrane. This so-called membrane electrode assembly is impermeable for molecules. Induced by a cell voltage, the low pressure hydrogen is split into protons and electrons at the anode side. The electrochemical potential across the membrane causes only the protons to pass, while the electrons are conducted via the cell plates. On the cathode side, the electrons and protons are recombined to form hydrogen at high pressure. One single cell can compress hydrogen from 1 to 900 bar, isothermally, which means in the most energy efficient way. The electrochemical cells are packed together to form a hydrogen compressor stack, and these stacks are manifolded to form an electrochemical compressor system. Electrochemical compressors are extremely reliable because all stacks are parallel installed in the system. Therefore, catastrophic failures are virtually impossible unlike mechanical compressors, which frequently suffer from seal failures, causing complete outage. Since only hydrogen protons can pass across the membrane, all other molecules present in the gas are automatically separated. This unique property of electrochemical cells is also used to selectively extract hydrogen from mixed gas streams. When compared to traditional mechanical compressors, the cost benefits of electrochemical compressors are very compelling. Once electrochemical compressors are produced in series, the capex will be a fraction of mechanical compressors. The fact that electrochemical compressors are sealless and have no moving parts makes them virtually maintenance-free, resulting in very low maintenance costs. For the same reason, electrochemical compressors have a very high uptime and minimum outage, preventing production losses. No moving parts also means that electrochemical compressors do not cause vibrations and don't produce noise, which makes them very suitable to be used in residential areas. Hyatt Hydrogen has successfully scaled up its hydrogen compressor stacks over the past five years, thereby reducing costs while increasing the market value. Based on our current HCS100 stack technology, we can offer compressor systems producing two tons hydrogen per day at a very competitive cost level. The next scale up to HCS500 stacks will further increase the value for transport mobility markets and widen the applications to large-scale industrial applications. Hyatt Hydrogen can deliver its compressor stacks in completely plug-and-play skid-mounted systems. Currently, we have delivered to clients in the US, Europe and Japan, meeting local standards and regulations. For the building and Heating power markets, we deliver the small cabinets, as shown on the left side, that are capable to handle up to 50 kg hydrogen per day. For the transport and mobility markets, we use standard container sizes for medium to large-scale systems, up to 2,000 kg hydrogen per day. One of the unique benefits when applying our systems in hydrogen refueling stations is that the same compressor can be used to fill both the medium pressure buffer at 450 bar and the high pressure buffer at 875 bar. Besides the hydrogen compression markets, we do see an increasing demand for selective extraction of hydrogen from mixed gas streams. Gas network operators explore the possibilities to use their existing networks for hydrogen transport, either as pure hydrogen pipelines or blended with natural gas. For both the high pressure pipelines, as well as for the low pressure distribution networks, cost-efficient hydrogen extraction is required. Hyatt's electrochemical separation technology has shown to be most cost-efficient for this purpose because it can recover more than 99% of the hydrogen produced at fuel cell grade. Electrochemical hydrogen separators offer unique benefits that conventional membranes and adsorption technologies cannot provide. The low-cost hydrogen purification stacks are mounted in a simple pressure-containing pipe spool thereby offering an easy scalable system by adding more stacks. When compared to existing membrane separators, the electrochemical separation stacks are much more selective in separating the hydrogen, which results in higher purities and lower energy costs. This all attributes to very low operational expenditures of less than 50 cents per kilogram hydrogen, 
making large applications and gas networks economically attractive. In summary, we can conclude that electrochemical hydrogen compressors offer the best operational performance for high pressure hydrogen storage, as currently applied in hydrogen refueling stations and power to power systems. Not only does it compress hydrogen at half the cost of mechanical compressors, it operates fully silent, safe and reliable, which are all very important aspects when operating these systems in residential areas. Electrochemical hydrogen separation is considered key enabling technology for efficient extraction of hydrogen from gas pipelines. It is one of the important technologies to make transport of hydrogen throughout pipelines economically viable. The hydrogen produced by electrochemical separators can be readily used for refueling power generation or as a feedstock for industrial processes. It is therefore that electrochemical hydrogen compression technologies and processing technologies will form an essential element in hydrogen-based energy infrastructures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. 我要再次衷心地感谢所有的演讲嘉宾在过去的一个小时当中深入前出的介绍此外我也向地形大家我们下周同一时间还会带来新一期的系列研讨会具体是请能可以去展望我们非常期待下一周再次见到您感谢 让我们开始现场的有通声的创意的文大环节, 谢谢. All right, thank you very much uh, for your attention for the past hour. Then we'll now uh, move to the panel discussion with our several speakers. <clears throat> so uh, I've noticed there are already uh, quite a couple of questions in the Q&A. And before I go to that, um, <clears throat> I've also prepared a couple of questions for a panel discussion. And as you can see, there is one speaker uh, present, Els de Witt, uh, from the Dutch government, Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water Management. Uh, her colleague in Beijing did the presentation, but Els de Witt will be uh, present and able for answering questions. So before I move, uh, on to the questions for the PIB members. I would like to ask a question uh, for Els. And I would like to ask if she can go a little bit more in depth in, in uh, hydrogen projects in general with, within her Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Yes, can you hear me? If that's okay, I've just started the video so I sh everybody should be able to see me, but I think it's more important that you can hear me um, and I'm honored to uh, be part of the panel uh, today. And I think what the various uh, speakers have already shown is that working together um, uh, with governments, industries and universities is key. And it's uh, a key asset to the Dutch policy, I think. We call it one of the uh, instruments that we use is the Partners in Business Program. But of course, there are various roles as governments that you can play. And uh, uh, besides um, supporting the PIB, the Dutch government also sets rules, regulations and standards and supports innovation. And I think what we've seen uh, also in a, a couple of the slides is that the progress that's been made for hydrogen in heavy duty applications and buses is something that is close to my heart as I started eight years ago in this field and we first ran innovative uh, programs in supporting these buses come to the market mm -hmm. in a test environment in cities in the Netherlands. And it's also working together with cities and provinces in that matter that can provide the scale up of these new techniques as we've seen in the Netherlands through the zero emission bus program. So from the Dutch government, we uh, made also agreements with all our decentralized authorities and stakeholders from industry um, uh, and we made the pledge to have zero emission transport for the buses by 2025, thus setting a clear target for industry 
uh, and for all other stakeholders as well to come up and provide us with solutions that can get us there. So apart from battery solutions, also fuel cell technology solutions. And I think that that uh, partnership has worked very well in the Netherlands and we are now copying it or have copied it also for other transport modes. So there is also a zero emission city distribution deal. There is a zero emission uh, deal for garbage trucks uh, in the Netherlands. And there's also a green deal with a zero emission target for maritime applications. Um, so you see that these instruments, a combination of these instruments can help us bring these uh, new innovative techniques uh, to the market and scale up and provide cost reduction because that is really what we need if we have these really, really ambitious CO2 targets. So that's all from me for this moment, Fons. Thank you. All right, thank you, Els, for this further elaboration. And we'll get back more to, to plans of the Netherlands. But I, I'd also like to give the word to, to some of the, the HiNet uh, members. Uh, and I would like to start with, uh, with HEC, because I think of, of all the HiNet members, I think uh, NetStack is already uh, quite active within, chi within the Chinese market. Uh, and perhaps he could ex uh, share uh, with us and the other panelists, and also, of course, with the audience, <clears throat> some of their experience within the, the Chinese market, uh, maybe some positive and some negative experience, and maybe some, some challenges that the other PAB members can take into consideration. Okay, sure. Um, I think the experiences can be subdivided into different application industries. For example, uh, stationary power plant applications, a lot of fuel cells in one place that uh, don't need to move. You don't have to worry about vibration. Um, that's a, an example of an application that has been relatively successful uh, with NEDSTAC in China. Um, another application uh, that is, uh, we're still working on um, I won't say unsuccessful, but it's one we're still working on, is the use of uh, a series of stacks to make a fuel cell system for use as a range extender targeted at uh, buses between uh, around 10 and a half meters and also for delivery vans. These delivery vans are the uh, yellow plated over 4.5 tons. So uh, that's something we're still working on. Uh, a challenge is the uh, location to do business. And I know that this um, Netherlands Innovation Network webinar series is planning on doing, I think the final uh, episode is about um, industry clusters. And uh, that's interesting because there are certainly um, industry clusters emerging in China and um, where you locate uh, is very important uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, specifically thanks to the recent uh, policy uh, released a few weeks ago here in China. Uh, this policy um, elevated hydrogen to an official clean energy fuel uh, thus making it relatively easier to permit applications requiring hydrogen. Uh, that has essentially moved the fuel cell industry in China from being focused on uh, fuel cell systems, taking hydrogen and making it into electricity, to the source of hydrogen itself. And uh, it's compression, uh, transportation, etc. So uh, you ask, um, what are some uh, uh, issues that uh, I think companies everywhere, both in China and overseas, should consider about the China market. And I would say um, the number one issue now, as I see it, is uh, fuel supply. And that fuel supply uh, has the related matters of cost. Um, a general figure is between 40 to 70 RMB per kilogram, and also how it's delivered. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, that's really what people should uh, be considering. I think if I had to put my finger on one point, that would be it. Uh, the supply, uh, readily available supply of automotive grade, uh, high purity hydrogen. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Heck. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to elaborate on this, um, but I, I, I would like to link this to Theo Hendricks. Uh, and first of all, Theo Hendricks, it's, it's nice to see you again during this uh, third webinar. You were also present during the first webinar, but then you really represented uh, HiNet, and now you're representing uh, HiMove. And I think High Move in the Netherlands, they already have a very tangible project. So, so hydrogen buses and, and also uh, transportation uh, methods. And actually within China, I think the transportation application is, is the most present and most active. So perhaps you could tell us something about uh, experience uh, from, from High Move side of hydrogen buses and maybe what you expect from the Chinese market, uh, where you see the challenges and opportunities. And there was also a question from the audience. Uh, you might also would like to answer at the same time. The question was if HiMove is planning to make hydrogen trucks as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I go into your questions about HiMove and the applications, uh, maybe you allow me one comment on the uh, on uh, the uh, 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 the introduction of uh, hack. Uh, what I would like to support is the uh, the fact that the hydrogen availability is a is a key element, uh, which has still maybe more uncertainties than the uh, application itself, the application in trucks, ships, in buses, etc. Uh, the, uh, at the moment, uh, we are doing uh, 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 as a as a uh, as a research item for our Ministry of Economic Affairs, making a comparison of the various uh, possibilities to supply and to store hydrogen. Uh, where, of course, compressed hydrogen or liquid hydrogen is an option either whether it's made from green electricity or from uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but for many applications, this is maybe a questionable way to store hydrogen. And uh, especially in China, we see that there are important uh, sources of hydrogen, for instance, from methanol. And uh, what we are working now is to evaluate uh, this kind of alternative storage uh, for um, uh, and uh, we're happy to say that we also do this in collaboration uh, with uh, some Chinese partners so that the research what we are doing is also available for uh, our Chinese colleagues. So uh, regarding high move indeed uh, we always focus from start on heavy duty applications, heavy duty automobility, uh, which means that the first sector we are working on, we're working on is buses. Uh, the key difference is uh, with all other uh, fuel cell systems that are available is that we from start selected all the components and the design of our systems to achieve two things. That is first a real long lifetime, uh, 25,000 hours and uh, the best possible uh, efficiency, fuel efficiency. And those are two elements that are extremely important for heavy duty applications to keep the cost low, not only to start, but especially during the operation. And uh, that means that, and then I can answer that question, is HiMove working on trucks as well? Yes, our fuel cell systems are designed to be very autonomous, so they can be, without any difficulty, can be implemented in buses, but also in trucks, in smaller ships, uh, in stationary applications. Uh, just because we decided from start, it should be an autonomous generator using hydrogen as the energy source. Energy source. Thank you very much, uh, Theo. Dan, I, I saw that you unmuted your microphone for a moment. Uh, does it mean you'd like to further elaborate on this? Um, well, I um, must say, I 
incidentally muted my microphone. <laughs> so uh, no, not really. Um, um, no, I just uh, if I'm open for any any questions from the audience or collaboration with other um, attendees of this um, uh, webinar. So uh, it was by incident. I'm sorry for that. No worries. But in that case, I'll, I will stay with you for a moment because th this actually is a very interesting topic for us to also hear the, the issues and uh, problems that the PIB is facing. Uh, because first of all, there was one question in the Q&A asking how the, the consulate general in Guangzhou uh, supports the PIB uh, and the hydrogen sector. So uh, one way is organizing this, uh, this webinar and providing a platform. And the second one is, of course, listening to problems and then see how we can solve them. So as we heard, one problem is the uh, availability of hydrogen. And I'll go to that uh, more in depth in a moment. Um, but for Kiwa, because I think it's interesting to hear uh, more issues from, from different angles. And because Kiwa is in the inspection and testing area um, and already active within China uh, in, in other regions than hydrogen. So, so uh, Dan, may I ask, uh, for, for Kia, where do you see the challenges um, for these uh, hydrogen uh, inspections and, and testing uh, for Kiwa in the Chinese markets? Is yeah, in, in, oh, in, yeah, in relation to um, uh, challenges, um, I must say that our lab is, um, is, is, is ready to go, so to say. We have, let's say, the, the facility here uh, up to date and we are able to serve uh, the Chinese customers. But in a way, uh, let's say the Chinese market is not yet fully um, um, ready uh, to, to go to the, uh, yeah, it's maybe a bit technical detail, but uh, to go on the, on the type four, um, hydrogen tank and if that will happen and if the standards are completed uh, within China then I think there will be a big step coming from the customers uh, possible customers in China and Kiwa is then already prepared and, and is ready to, to serve them so I wouldn't say I'm, I'm just waiting for um, let's say the Chinese standards or the legislation to be ready um, in that way I personally don't see any uh, well difficulties for reaching out to um, to the Chinese uh, market. No. All right, that, that's very good to hear. Uh, th thank you, Dan, uh, for that further elaboration. And because uh, Masha Smith is not here, unfortunately, I cannot ask uh, questions uh, related to her. But I think it would be interesting to hear uh, your opinion as well, uh, Marco Betting. Um, where do you see the, the major um, obstacles uh, when, when trying to enter the Chinese market? Well, that's a good question. We, as Hyatt uh, Hydrogen, uh, are relatively new to the Chinese market, so we don't have a foothold yet in, uh, in, in Chinese um, um, operations uh, of uh, where we apply our hydrogen uh, compression and purification technologies. We see an uptake, I mean, in Europe, US, Far East, in the hydrogen refueling station, so application of high pressure storage. And we just last year started to explore opportunities to work together with um, Chinese consortia to uh, form a um, group of companies that could start working on a demonstration of this new type of electrochemical compressors to be used in, in hydrogen refueling stations. So for us, it's just exploring the Chinese market uh, from the very beginning. So I'm um, well, really honored to be here in this, uh, in this uh, panel to listen also to the challenges that the Chinese uh, audience has uh, on using hydrogen in their refueling stations and how to overcome the challenges they have with high pressure storage and using compressors to do that. And um, we are gladly taking any answers uh, or questions uh, for us uh, to see where we, whether we can help. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco. Um, before, before I continue uh, with the panel discussion, I, I would like to give the word to Els again. 
Uh, and maybe we can see from a, a Dutch government perspective, um, after hearing that the PAB members kind of all face this issue of hydrogen availability, is there something or some concrete steps that, that the Dutch government is taking to ensure that this, this problem will decrease and the amount of hydrogen will, will increase in the future? Yes, Fons, thank you very much. And I hope that everybody gets access to the presentation I sent um, uh, earlier uh, yesterday to, uh, to you. Uh, yeah, so please uh, uh, make that available. I think challenges on a national level, I very much agree. Uh, it is a supply of hydrogen. I think uh, from the transport side, we've been asking for this type of zero emission energy carrier for quite a number of years and it was very very promising that our ministry of economic affairs and climate brought out uh, the national cabinet vision on hydrogen earlier uh, this year i think that this is a momentous step in the in dutch uh, energy policy in which they really um, uh, yeah in, uh, um, ha embraced hydrogen uh, as a key uh, energy driver in the complete energy transition that we have to do, thus making it also more available for all the different sectors. And of course, as you know, transport is one of the sectors in which these new energies yeah, have, have a high um, uh, payback. Uh, versus industry uh, segments, so they are envisage envisaged in a transition uh, later on. But Economic Affairs wants to start with the transport and the mobility sector first. And we've said we really need a backbone. So in one of the slides, I had a challenge is also, hey, you see that the possible hydrogen backbone that is now being uh, considered within the Netherlands, you also partly reusing existing gas systems. I mean, how you need it, they're all looking at that. But we also need, of course, hydrogen from abroad. It has to be shipped in, it has to be imported as well. And we connect it up to a renewable energy task that we have as the Netherlands as well, with more wind and more solar. And then, uh, of course, uh, the production uh, will be partly uh, also uh, on land. And I think the Groningen, uh, we work together in one of the European co-financing synergy calls that is actually looking at um, storing also uh, um, the capacity for hydrogen to store uh, in, the, in TSO 2020. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we as a mobility sector get a, f a good fuel supply, uh, get that at the right quality, uh, because I heard that earlier said as well, I think Hox mentioned it in his presentation, I think that uh, the quality of the hydrogen is also important. And as a transport mode, we are looking now at, at a new strategy for hydrogen as well, and what transport modes uh, use what type of hydrogen. Uh, it won't be gas for all the modes. Perhaps, uh, you know, in other shapes, it will also come to the transport market. And um, I think one thing, Fons, that I would like to add, if I've got now the opportunity, I will be very brief, but from the government side, we're trying our utmost also to connect up to our Chinese counterparts on a governmental level uh, in this field of smart and sustainable mobility. And we have what is called also a zero emission vehicle alliance in which we have also struck a partnership up with the Chinese uh, uh, agency that works for multiple governments uh, that's called Qatar. And we've had uh, also hydrogen workshops with them last year. And I think it's very valuable for us. It's also uh, looking uh, what is the right connecting uh, connections to be made on a ministerial level. Um, but I think we're growing. And I think also with Ministry of Economic Affairs now coming into play and this much more becoming an international cooperation uh, field, there are quite a few um, uh, alliances that we're striking up and that hopefully also will benefit to uh, to you as companies um, um, in order to come and work together more closely also with the, with Chinese uh, Chinese uh, partners. So we're very open for any uh, uh, questions that you have or um, uh, so let's keep on working together. I think that that would be the, the thing that I take from this panel and, and see how we can get that to the next level. Yeah, creating markets together. Yeah, thank you very much, Els. Uh, I, I will come back later to, to the uh, zero emission vehicles uh, because, because I, I understood that's very important, important in your ministry. Uh, but before I, I'd like to ask the panelists, the PIB members, uh, would anyone like to further elaborate on, on what Els just said? I think uh, Heck is raising his hand, so uh, please, Heck, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um... 
this is just an idea I had about hydrogen supply. I've heard that in the Netherlands, there is a very large uh, project to create hydrogen uh, in offshore wind farms. Uh, I think what um, Mrs. DeWitt just mentioned about the hydrogen backbone might be related to that. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about that. And I think that other folks in China would be too, because I think that offshore, um, I was just talking about this this morning with someone else in Shandong province, uh, offshore uh, wind farms is a big deal in China and producing hydrogen. That could be something um, Mrs. DeWitt talked about creating markets. I think that could be a very good um, Sino-Dutch uh, opportunity. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Heck. Uh, before I give the word to you, Els, um, uh, I, I first want to apologize because this is not really the topic of uh, today's webinar. And I think the first two webinars in our series already elaborated quite a lot on this. So I, I don't want to go too much into that, uh, but else if you would like to give a reply, you're, you're very welcome to. Uh, yeah, very quickly, let's speed up uh, uh, bilateral or with any of the panelists, I would like to uh, continue. And, and also uh, I will invite Han Veenstra, my, my direct colleague at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate, uh, who is running uh, these, uh, these projects. And that's exactly heck what we're trying uh, to achieve. And I think what is very, very interesting for China, because it's such a huge country, and they need also uh, abilities for decentralized uh, uh, power production uh, of, uh, of, of hydrogen. And I think that uh, if, if you look upon the shift that we have to make in the mobility sector, us with 8 million cars, but of course uh, in China, much, much more. And if you then look on the electricity grid, I mean, the energy is going to be key whether we will be able to make this transition or not. And then I think hydrogen is also for China a very viable option uh, in, that, uh, in that transition. Uh, thank you very much, Els. I think that, that summarizes it quite nicely and in a very short way. Uh, and, and heck, we, we are aware of, of what you mentioned. And, and we know that the, the, the request for information on this within China is, is very big. So of course, we'll see what, what we can do and, and how we can further uh, focus on this part. Uh, and Fons, perhaps just to, to get more of a, of, of a focus on today's webinar, hey, where you look upon transportation of hydrogen and also hey, the heavy industry, because I think that backbone, that is also in my presentation, hey, for transportation is very, very important, especially for China, such a big country. And the applications that we now see for hydrogen in the Netherlands is really in that heavy industry segment. A lot of people in the Netherlands believe that the heavy duty, hey, all the trucks would be running on batteries. I think more and more we gain insight now that part of the city distribution will be electric, battery electric driven. But if you're talking about long haul, if we're talking about inland shippers that go all the way with a full cargo right up until Switzerland, they need the power. And that is the added value of hydrogen. That's where hydrogen comes into a natural play almost. And we see now more and more that the ports in the Netherlands are more interested and that links up to producing that renewable energy offshore, bringing that onshore in ports where you have your first applications already there that, that, that can use it directly, that need a lot of power. So those are really interesting new developments uh, in the Netherlands at the moment. And I know that on the ports, they're also looking at Shanghai harbors, etc. So I, f I fully al align with what was said earlier by one of the panelists. You have to look up on the regions in China where you can make the difference, where these policies can take place. And, uh, and that's where also a U.S. consulate funds and our embassy uh, are crucial to, uh, to, to help us unleash these, uh, these, these, yeah, these fast moving regions and cities in China also that, uh, uh, that, 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 that can take up these first new uh, techniques, these new developments. And this is, of course, also uh, where, where all the opportunities are and, and why there are so many good opportunities. I, I'd love to, to first switch to a couple of the questions. Uh, in the Q&A, and, and then I will uh, continue with the opportunities within the Netherlands uh, for the PIB members, and also a little bit of the PIB uh, cooperation and, and innovation that they, they have together. But also because of the time, and I've, I've noticed the Q&A is kind of uh, stacking up. Uh, I have a very interesting question uh, for Kiwa, and this person is asking if it's possible 
uh, to perform a product certification based on European regulation within China. And then the product can be developed and produced in China, but sold in the EU. Yeah, well, that's um, it's possible. It it's, um, it depends, of course, on um, let's say there's no no uh, challenge for us to receive the specimens uh, or the samples which are to be tested here at uh, Kiva Apeldoorn. So there's a possibility that the samples will be shipped to um, the Netherlands. But um, as a certification company, we do need to have accredited testing data, meaning, which I said already in my presentation, we can only validate uh, testing data, which is accredited, meaning that they uh, are able, for example, to test their products within a lab in China, which is accredited by ISO 17025. If that's the case, we can uh, use the data and implement the data in our certification. So in that way, uh, well, we are flexible. Um, that comes for, for European standards and actually that counts also for US standards and um, well, ISO standards globally. I hope this will answer the question. So there's, it all depends on um, the data we receive. Um, when the testing is done here in Kiva, uh, in Apeldoorn in the Netherlands, there's uh, no problem for that because we are accredited and all the data um, obtained here is valid so um, that's that's uh, a thing we are able to do we do that already with a lot of foreign customers that they can hand in their own uh, test data all right thank you dan I, I think that that's a very good answer to the question asked so if there's a follow-up question uh, from the the person in the q a please feel free to ask again and i will bring it up in the meantime, I'll go to the next question, actually asked by the same uh, person, but this question is uh, focused on Theo Hendricks' high move. Uh, and, and the question is how high move sees the um, heavy duty vehicle market in China, so hydrogen heavy duty vehicles, and uh, what's uh, high, move, high move's role um, within China? Well, I think uh, in connection to what uh, else uh, David said, uh, the uh, heavy duty uh, automobility trucks and buses that is where the hydrogen uh, and fuel cell technology will really penetrate so that will be valid in Europe but certainly also in China where the need for zero emission transportation is maybe even uh, stronger than in some parts of Europe um, and of course it's also part of the of the, the strategy of the Chinese government to uh, penetrate and to develop this kind of technology in China. And uh, I'm quite sure that in a few years, uh, or maybe even now already, uh, China is leading the way to uh, hydrogen mobility. Uh, I move role in this. Uh, uh, well, maybe I should emphasize that the quality of uh, and the performance of a hydrogen vehicle is partly depending on the quality and the performance of the fuel cell stacks that are used. Uh, equally important, however, is the how the uh, the fuel cell is integrated in a into a fuel cell engine, and how the fuel cell engine is integrated into a vehicle that's at least as important as the fuel cell stack itself. Um, and that's exactly where high move has its know-how. Uh, we are not a producer of fuel cell stacks. We buy the fuel cell stacks, which are those fuel cell stacks which are best for the application. And in Europe, we buy the fuel cell stacks for heavy duty application of NAS stack. Um, and of course, also we work with NetStack on the Chinese market. But from the integration side, the integration technology, that of course is applicable to all kinds of fuel cell stacks and all kinds of vehicles. And uh, the, uh, we have some, we have a, a patented integration technology that can be used 
and can be used in China and as in Europe to reduce the, uh, the fuel of consumption of a heavy duty vehicle, but also to protect the life of the battery system, which is always used in connection with the fuel cell system. So the, the, uh, the interaction between the fuel cell system as an energy generator and the battery as a short term storage and supplier of peak energy that is crucial for the performance and the reliability of the application. That's where we see our contribution also to the Chinese market. Thank you, Theo Hendricks. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, NetStack because during the presentation session, uh, there was a question for NetStack actually. Uh, and I, I saw Hack already reply, but maybe Hack would like to reply as well uh, in the live session. Because the question was if it's possible for fuel stacks, stacks to stack them and reach a nominal power of 100 kilowatts. I think that's an integration question, not really a, a stack question. Um, Dr. Hendricks, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's exactly what we do uh, in our system. Uh, the, uh, the, it's, it's very important how stacks are combined, how stacks are combined into a system to, to supply 100 kilowatt, uh, 300, 500 kilowatt, whatever is needed. Uh, it's a matter of, uh, of designing it in such a way that, first of all, the output voltage of the fuel cell system is as closely as possible to the, to the uh, high voltage in the, uh, for the application. That's one point. Other points are how to keep the, the, uh, the uh, current, the amperes, uh, amperage uh, within certain limit, limits uh, because that's crucial for the life of the power electronics that's used in combination with the fuel cell system. So yeah, it's, it's uh, fuel cell stacks can be uh, for uh, can be stacked until any uh, applic any uh, power that is needed. Also, the the, the power stations of NetStack is uh, they are stacked until two, three, four megawatt. Uh, so that's all possible as long as the the integration is done in the right way. All right, I, I see uh, Hack nodding, so I think that, that answered the question <laughs> quite clearly. Uh, in that case, because there's still a couple of questions I, I, I'd like to um, manage today, uh, and this question is from uh, from Willem Hasenberg, and he's asking. Uh, I think it's a question for Marco Betting. Uh, the question is. What will be Hyatt's power needs, CO2 emission, uh, the chemical compressor for hydrogen? So what will be Hyatt's power needs? Yeah, I saw, I saw the question coming by on the, the Q&A list. Um, so the power needs are typically between the two and a half and six kilowatt hours per kilogram hydrogen compressed. And that depends basically on the discharge pressure that you need to, um, um, to, to have to have the, the hydrogen on. So for high pressure buffers, you can go to 450 bar. That would be in the range of two and a half kilowatt hours per kilogram. And if you have to go to the 875 bar, that could go up to five kilowatt hours per kilogram. Also, depending a little bit on the source of the hydrogen, you can imagine that hydrogen can be produced by alkaline electrolyzers at very low pressure, then the pressure of the hydrogen going into the compressor is at one bar. And that will also determine how uh, big your power needs are. On the other hand, also hydrogen refueling stations are filled by tube traders and they enter the compressor at 200 bars and then you have a very low energy needs to be low one kilowatt hour per kilogram. So it's a little bit depending on the source of the hydrogen and the discharge pressure you need to bring the hydrogen to. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marco. I, I think that gave a very clear answer. Uh, let me move on to, to uh, another question, a uh, question for Michelle. And I think this question is um, for Heck. Uh, and I, I think it's a very interesting question and I'd love to see Heck's uh, opinion on this. So the question is, uh, because fuel cells in China, especially nowadays, they are often paired with batteries to 
create a type of hybrid system uh, and especially in transportation industry it's being used so how do the dutch players so let's first start with heck and then maybe a uh, tail or maybe uh, dan marco would like to elaborate on this but but where do the dutch players um, see the opportunities and and do you can you meet this kind of uh, demand well okay um i think i'll try to do uh, two birds with one stone here because i see another question asking about uh, system integration for maritime so i'll try to give a basic overview of this concept but again this is a system level question not a stack level question but again the basic concept is that a fuel cell engine works like a diesel generator um, it uh, is a, a single direction uh, not like a battery which can be charged it's a single direction and it depends on the fuel in the system it depends on pressures flow rates and that uh, means it has a limitation to its dynamic response now uh, the limitation to its dynamic response uh, in uh, vehicles that's often seen as what's called turbo lag if you have a turbocharger for example in your car or in a sports car you know that over a certain rpm when the turbocharger spools up you get higher compression into your cylinders and you get more power uh, in a similar way a fuel cell requires response time um, not only when it's warmed up at its operating temperature but also what's called cold startup which can take a few minutes or maybe even 10 minutes to reach operating temperature. So if you need power immediately, you can draw it from a battery, for example, in a city car that is starting and stopping often. It may even have a combination of fuel cell and um, a, a dynamic recharging of the battery. On the opposite, ex uh, on the opposite extreme would be a fuel cell power plant. It doesn't need any dynamic response. Once it's going, it's base plate power capacity doesn't need to change its load, or hopefully it doesn't need to do. Now in the middle are ships, big ships that need to power up when they leave port and travel at 100% uh, power to um, navigate out of the port. But then once they're traveling in open water, they have a relatively steady output. That kind of steady output is ideal for a fuel cell. But the um, uh, power fluctuations, dynamic response needs of operating in the port are um, better suited to batteries. And so to uh, Michelle, I would say um, uh, the, uh, the fuel cell and batteries operate as a hybrid system. And just like your car, which also has a battery, um, a fuel cell vehicle uh, requires a battery. Of course, the, uh, what's called the power share, uh, the ratio of the fuel cell power in kilowatts to the battery in kilowatt hours, and also considering its discharge rate is going to affect your calculations. But that's more into the actual system design. So I think those are three examples um, showing the uh, difference in dynamic response across different uh, applications for fuel cells. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Heck, uh, for that uh, in-depth uh, collaboration on, on the question asked. Uh, there are a couple of uh, more questions remaining. Uh, there's one question for you, Heck, in the Q&A. Uh, I kindly ask you to, to reply it in the Q&A session first, and then uh, if there's time left, I'll, we'll handle it live. Uh, but, but before, I'd like to go in, into a final okay. discussion part. And that is because within China, there are actually many hydrogen application product, projects but many of them are separated um, also within the country, but there are not really uh, a lot of integrated hydrogen systems or projects uh, like in Groningen or uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, and then now in the Netherlands, especially uh, besides those two regions, we have this uh, hydrogen PIB uh, with uh, like hydrogen uh, champions, uh, local champions, if you'd say, kind of working together focusing on Chinese market, but of course, uh, the Dutch market is also important for you. Uh, I'm curious if, if there is a cooperation or innovative uh, collaboration between the PIB members uh, within the Netherlands mm -hmm. to make full use of the hydrogen opportunities uh, that are offered. Uh, maybe Marco Betting, uh, could I give the word to you first? Uh, yes, I think there is from um... 
from our perspective, uh, a num number of initiatives where we could cooperate through the whole uh, value chain of uh, producing hydrogen, compressing hydrogen, storing hydrogen, and also uh, making uh, power out of hydrogen. So there's initiatives here in the Arnhem region. And also, I think in the north part of the Netherlands, there is a number of initiatives that uh, make use of uh, the strength of our uh, Dutch uh, partners. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Uh, and again, because uh, as you, as the audience uh, could have seen during the presentation session, the PV members they they really covered the whole uh, hydrogen supply chain uh, in the Netherlands, um, making it, it a really strong uh, example. Uh, and especially in China, these kind of uh, projects are very interested. Uh, maybe Dan, uh, would you also like to further collaborate a little bit on what Kiwa expects from the PAB? Um, yeah, I think I'll um, um, agree with, also with, with Marco about this. Um, it's a very good um, yeah, way to, to get in, in, in touch and, and set foot on, on um, especially new uh, grounds in China. Because what we all see and we saw in, in our uh, visit last September in the Wuhan area and the Rugao area that it's... Um, it's still a quite a complex um, um, environment or infrastructure to work on. Um, and I think to collaborate with all the members of the PRB, it would be uh, enforce uh, the, 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 the collaboration within, uh, well, let's say, our organization. So um, to divert also information and possible um, uh, contacts within the PRB is a very good way uh, to contribute to, to the, yeah, well, the, the better infrastructure and the better um, energy transition in, in, in China. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, perhaps, Teo, you would also like to uh, elaborate a little bit more on this? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think the, the Netherlands is a very small country, especially if compared to China, uh, which is a, a big country, big market, big companies. Um, being small uh, is always, always requires to cooperate uh, to make a difference. And that's, I think, is part of the Dutch history and uh, also the Dutch state of mind, looking at how we can, can, how can we be stronger together. And that's also the idea of the PIB. Um, of course, to bring a hydrogen application to the market, the whole supply chain needs to be covered. If there is one element missing, from production, through logistics, through storage, through delivery, through the application. Uh, each link is essential. And uh, the, uh, I think from our mindset and also in the way we approach technology, this is always uh, key uh, to our success. And uh, I, I hope that we can bring a little bit of this system approach to China where uh, this maybe hasn't been so developed as it is in our country. Uh, thank you very much, Theo. Uh, and I think this would also be a, a very good conclusion uh, to, to, of today's uh, webinar. But before I conclude, there is, there is one question asked in Chinese, and uh, I just got a sent to me uh, translated in English. Uh, and this question is uh, for uh, Marco Betting, because Marco mentioned that there is a pilot project at the moment uh, in China. And uh, the question is if they are looking uh, for other Chinese partners for cooperation on hydrogen refueling station projects. And if yes, uh, maybe Marco can specif specify on what kind of uh, potential partners they are looking for. Yeah, so the pilot I mentioned that we are discussing at the moment uh, is in the Shanghai area. Uh, it's an uh, early days uh, consortium containing of uh, a few big uh, traditional oil and gas operators in the Chinese area, as well as a research institute in Shanghai, 
and the province. So together we are looking at a way to bring our technology to the um, um, to the hydrogen refueling stations. And there is, of course, always uh, a need to have uh, an, a further strengthening of this uh, consortium. So I'm happy to um, discuss that afterwards with the person who asked the question. Uh, what what could be the interest? We are still looking also for a company who can locally in China build uh, the systems around our compressor so that we have local content in our system. Of course, the electrochemical uh, technology is partly produced here in the Netherlands, but it can also be built together in a system uh, locally in China. So for these kind of uh, partners that can bring system integration uh, to the to the table we would be very interested to speak to all right thank you very much marco uh, uh, we will share uh, all the contact information of the, the panelists today uh, with the audience via our website the presentations will be shared as well and of course the the whole webinar with the presentation session and the q a session uh, will be uploaded uh, by to do tomorrow, uh, and you can rewatch it uh, that way as well. Before I conclude, uh, we hope to see you again next week. Uh, next week's topic will be uh, science and technology, so hydrogen from a science and technology perspective. Um, it's at the same time, same day next week. And of course, I would love to thank all the panelists today for being present and for sending their very interesting videos to us. Uh, to learn more about the PIB uh, Hydrogen Alliance and, of course, also uh, all the interesting uh, hydrogen ap applications uh, within the Netherlands. So thank you very much again, and we hope to see you again next week.